On May 13th, 1873, there was a sea battle in Torbay. Um, it consisted of two uh, revenue cutters from the revenue service and two smugglers' ships. Uh, one of the smugglers' ships had a, uh, 16 cannons on board and they, they exchanged fire. Uh, the reason for the, uh, the smugglers coming in was they were depositing a very large uh, consignment of tea, smuggled tea, over at Paynton Beach. Uh, they then ensured a mass fight on Paynton Beach between the, the revenue men and a hundred locals. And uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the people we know that were involved was a gentleman from Cockington, just over on my right here. Smuggling was a massive business. This was just one small skirmish uh, in a long-going, uh, hundreds of years of, um, of smuggling uh, along the sort of uh, Devon and Cornwall coasts. Devon and Cornwall were particularly uh, prone to smuggling, partly because we're, we're not that far from, um, from France and, and Spain a little bit further on. Uh, and also the Isles of Scilly, which was a little bit of a sort of smuggler's paradise. So goods would come up, go to the Isles of Scilly and then hit the South Devon coast. We're talking about a massive industry here. We're not talking about one or two people. Across England, we think that 60,000 smugglers, were met, mostly men, were directly involved, but supported by you know, possibly another 100,000 uh, women and children who would actually distribute the goods across the, um, across the whole peninsula and then further up to London. An awful lot of people were involved in this, and the kind of goods we're talking about were the obvious ones the sort of brandy and tobacco, but also things like playing cards. And the motivation was obviously profit. So we're saying that um, you could buy uh, brandy or tobacco in France at um, one-fifth or one-tenth of the price you could actually sell it in England. However, this wasn't risk-free. Uh, we had the uh, we had the revenue men who were scattered along the coast, but there was only sort of four bases, so they couldn't really sort of control what was coming in. So most smugglers actually got away with this, and they got away with, uh, with huge profits. And right along the coast, we've got um, uh, examples of places that were, were actually named. Uh, there's, a, there's a Brandy Cove, not very far around, around the coast here. There's lots of smugglers' coves. And so these, these large ships would actually come in and then distribute the goods. As the, um, the revenue service got better ships, got better funded, then Torbay became, as itself, became sort of less prone to sort of smuggling. So then we're going into the sort of, you know, turn of the century. So we're getting into the 1810s and whatever, and smuggling then tended to take place in more of the isolated coves, which are a little bit out of the way further along the coast here. Uh, they're also out of view of the um, of Brixham Coast Guard and the, the, the Brixham Garrison uh, on the cliffs over there, so they weren't, weren't seen, uh, seen as well. So this, this level of um, corruption, this... Uh, this level of income that was actually coming in uh, generated profit so that it was very difficult even if a smuggler was apprehended to actually get somebody to stand up in court and we've got lots of examples here of of, um, of cases going to court and there being no witnesses and Rudyard Kipling wrote a, uh, wrote a poem saying watch the wall as a gentleman go by because it was a, it was a criminal offence, a serious criminal offence if you didn't give a witness uh, statement so the way to get around that is if you saw the gentleman come and you think there might be smugglers, you would literally turn round and face the wall. So you could legitimately say in court that you saw nothing because you didn't. Um, so smuggling, if the mass smuggling tended to sort of die out early in the sort of 19th century, but it goes on today and these coves are still prone occasionally to other kinds of contraband coming into Devon and Cornwall.